Hello to you fellow listeners. Welcome to yet another episode of The Bigger Picture, Ecospire's very own new podcast series, where we chat up with the experts in the field of economics to bring to you an intellectually stimulating take on various topics in subject matter that is economics, leaving you better able to comprehend the nitty-gritties of many topics that one casually comes across on business channels but just walks by. So put on your earphones, kick back, kick back and eyes as I speak to our guest for the day. Ms. M. V. Lee Badgett. So, Ms. M. V. Lee Badgett is a renowned economist and expert in the field of LGBTQ plus economics. She is currently a distinguished professor of economics at the University of Massachusetts, MS, and serves as the founding director of the university's School of Public Policy. Badgett has spent her uh, career conducting research and providing policy recommendations on a wide range of topics related to LGBTQ plus issues including employment discrimination, same-sex marriage, and poverty. Her work has been published in numerous academic journals, and she has authored several books, including When Gay People Get Married and The Public Professor, How to Use Your Research to Change the World. In addition to her academic work, Badgett has served as a consult- uh, consultant to various organizations and governments on LGBTQ plus issues, and has testified before the U.S. Congress on discrimination and inequality. She is a prominent advocate for LGBTQ plus rights, and her work has a significant impact on the public public policy and social attitude towards the LGBTQ plus community. It's a pleasure to have you on the podcast. So, thanks, thank you, Manit. I'm happy to be here. Before we start, would you like to just uh, address uh, address the listeners of the podcast? Um, I am, uh, I, I, I think somebody who believes very strongly that it's important to know about economics and to know about how it gets used in the real world. So I think it's great that you all are, are trying to, to bring this to, to wider attention. Yes, that, that is the basic uh, goal of our podcast to help our listeners get our advocate about such issues, etc. So jumping right in, uh, my first question to you would be like, how does the lack of legal recognition for gender non-conf- uh, non-conf- non-conforming individuals in India affect their economic opportunities like job discrimination and access to credit, etc.? Yeah, legal recognition is so important for uh, for people who identify as transgender or uh, one of the different kinds of terms that get, get used in different countries, or even people who don't think of themselves as being part of that gender binary. Um, and that's because uh, when we go apply for jobs or or uh, apply for credit, um, these questions get asked. This is like a common way of identifying yourself. And unless, and in most countries, unless you can, you know, prove you are who you say you are and that you are, you know, uh, registered for all the appropriate, uh, all all the appropriate uh, settings, uh, then it's it's going to be very hard to to get a job or to get credit. So I think that's a that's one of the most important issues globally. I would say for people who are, uh, you know, kind of not not cisgender, not still just identifying with the the sex that they were assigned at birth, but but who think of themselves with some other gender identity. Absolutely, I like totally agree with your points. Like it is definitely very hard to come out of the closet, especially in a country like India, where people are not vocal, then people, people still consider it as a taboo, right? So I I could not agree more with your points. So like coming to the second question uh, I had, how has the inclusion of LGBTQ individuals in the workplace and workforces affected the economy, according to you? Well, LGBTI people, LGBTQ people, um, you know, kind of the wide range of sexual and gender minorities have a lot to contribute to society. And we do participate uh, in in the economy in many different ways. I think one of the most important ways that uh, that we can understand the role of inclusion is to look at the workplace. Um, when, uh, when, when people are working and are at their most productive, when they feel accepted, when they're not being harassed by people they work with, when their bosses are treating them fairly, that gives people the uh, uh, the respect that uh, that we all need, really, to to keep going and to uh, and to be able to uh, produce a, at the highest level uh, for whatever it is that we're working on. So, um, so in that sense, 
policies that employers have that are about making people um, feel exclu- feel included and uh, policies that prevent other people from treating them badly um, are, are absolutely essential in, in that way. Um, and it's, you know, it's hard to be very precise about what that what that effect is overall, but we do know that there's lots of evidence of discrimination against LGBTQ people uh, in the workplace in India, in the United States, pretty much everywhere in the world. Um, and uh, to me, that suggests that we are that we are constrained, that there is not full inclusion. Companies are getting better. At, uh, at recognizing this issue. And this is certainly true uh, in India as well. Uh, the you know, larger corporations are starting to be very conscious of the need to have good policies in the workplace about not discriminating, um, perhaps uh, having policies against harassment and also in some cases having uh, making sure that um, human resources policies and and benefits policies are f- also fully inclusive of LGBTQ individuals. And, uh, you know, companies themselves say, we, we don't do this just because we're nice people. <laughs> uh, we, we do this because it's good for our businesses. So we hear a lot of companies talk about what they call the business case. They think that by being more inclusive of LGBTQ people, they will do better financially. Um, and that's because uh, people will be more productive. And it's also because they'll be able to attract the best workers and hold on to them once they've trained them. So these are all things that companies, many companies care a lot about. Um, and that's why they say uh, they are they are taking on this this these efforts to to be more inclusive. And there's some research that shows that actually, they're absolutely right. Um, there's research in the in the business world that shows that um, uh, that companies uh, most of this comes from the United States so far. But but you know I know there's a lot of interest in in India as well. Hopefully somebody will do this at some point. But in the United States, companies that have more inclusive policies towards LGBTQ people are uh, have higher stock prices. They have higher profit levels. They are able to attract more creative uh, individuals. They have higher productivity in their workforce. So the research really backs up what employers say are the main reasons they they do this. Uh, like like you just mentioned that you would like to see that in a country like India also. Uh, so that is something that is actually happening also right now. Like it has started to begin, uh, like started because it is evident in like startups like popular startups like Boat and other unicorns because they have this policy with uh, in, like inclusive policy they have a good reputation and a good goodwill in the market so i guess that is a beginning step but we still have a yes. long way to go yeah yeah well everybody has a long way to go <laughs> definitely exactly so uh, my next question would be what is the economic cost of workplace discrimination against LG- lgbtq plus people like and how does this impact overall productivity and the profitability of a company? Well, yeah. So I just mentioned some studies that show that it does seem to have an impact on companies. If we were to think about adding it up, we would get a bit of a sense of what um, what the uh, the be- benefits of inclusion are to society as a whole. And we're we're doing this in different ways. I did the first study um, back in 2014 on um, uh, the impact of homophobia and transphobia on India's economy. And, um, and there, I think, we're th- what we're thinking about, what I'm thinking about is the, the imp- really important role of human capital in, uh, in determining how well an economy does. And this is also true in, in the workplace as well. Um, you know, human capital for an economist is about the skills, the knowledge, the creativity that, that workers bring. And so if you don't get enough education or if you're if you're bullied in education uh, in, in school or at university, if you're bullied, then you're you may not learn as much as you need. If you're um, experiencing um, that kind of treatment, your health is not going to be as good as it could be. We know that stigma actually does literally make people sick, uh, both in terms of mental health and physical health. And so then the kind of workplace issues that we talked about a minute ago all all add up. And, um, you know, so, so like the, the 
the problem is the, the data we have to measure what those impacts are are mainly in the health arena, and then to a certain extent in the uh, in in the employment arena. And so it can be it can be billions of rupees, billions of dollars uh, that uh, that are lost um, both to employers as a whole and also really to, to the entire economy because of that loss of, of human capital. So, so it can have very, uh, very clear, very damaging effects on, on how well businesses and economies do. Uh, I guess it is like especially important for India to adapt these policies right now because like it has such a young population and these will be the future, like this will be the building block for its future. So I guess it is very essential time for them to implement such policy, right? Exactly. Yes. Yes. It's never too late because you're always talking about the future as well. Hmm. Okay. So moving from that, uh, what are the potential economic benefits of legalizing like same-sex marriage or LGBTQ plus couples marri marrying? And how this how might this impact the government's budget? Yeah, that's a good question. I will admit I have not looked at that that issue in India. Um, I think what we would want to know is how marriage is built into to social protection schemes. Um, uh, in many governments, rely on families to provide a basic uh, level of support for each other, um, and um, and I think that means that. When it comes to to tough times that people run into, inevitably economically or in terms of health, um, that that we've got we've got somebody to take care of us. And if you know if families are there, then uh, that means that the government uh, won't have to provide as much support potentially. So so it may be that by making families stronger, legally stronger, and symbolically stronger, because marriage has. You know some practical effects, but it also has a very strong symbolic effect. It tells people you are a full citizen uh, uh, of our country. You have the right to marry the person that you, that you love, and um, and that that um, removes a form of stigma that is also something that might be holding people back. As I mentioned earlier, stigma can make you sick, right? So, so uh, sometimes the stigma comes from interpersonal uh, relationships and, and interactions, and sometimes it comes from how the government <laughs> looks at who we are. So, uh, so policies like marriage equality uh, can can be really good for people's health, and in that way, uh, can also potentially be good economically. So those would be a couple of ways that 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 uh, I think it would be interesting to think about and take a look at in the Indian context. But I I don't know of people who've actually done that research. Well, like the marriage issue is a like very big issue, especially right now because yes, the, like there was a pending bill regarding the. Marriage uh, and then it got rejected right now, but it has been applied again and again, and it has moved to the Supreme Court as right, I, as as, right. as I'm aware right now. So we can all only hope right now. We ha we are still very behind, on that, but that is something to improve, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Well, it takes a while. You know, it takes a while. It takes discussion. It takes mm -hmm. people seeing, starting to see LGBTQ people as being really fully human and. Uh, and and respecting the the kinds of choices that that they might make in terms of marriage partners that it may you know may look a little bit different but it's the same love same desire to have family same desire to connect families together because that's the other thing that that marriage tends to do so yeah so I think that's right I think sometimes that it, it it's a process uh, and uh, it will be very exciting to see what happens in the Supreme Court exactly. Uh, so, moving to my next next question. So, according to you, what are the steps that can be taken by the policymakers or the businessmen to promote inclusion and reduce the negative economic impact of like homophobia and transphobia, especially in India? Mm -hmm. Some of it is about making it very clear that discrimination is uh, is uh, not allowed. Um, this is a common kind of tool that we use for thinking about gender equality or equality of other kinds of uh, minority groups or in the case of India in terms of caste. 
um, and make expanding that to include uh, sexual orientation and gender identity, I think is very is very important for for establishing uh, both that baseline idea of equality, but also the ability to have some recourse if you feel like you have uh, faced discrimination of some kind. So that's that's what laws will give you. I think another important thing that the governments can do is to uh, is to think harder about. Um, about the actual lived experiences of LGBTQ people. So we know that, uh, again, in many countries, you know, when we have low income people, a lot of them are LGBTQ and they face the same kinds of challenges in providing for themselves and their families as other low income people do. Um, and in many parts of the world, India included, we've, we've seen lots of attention again, in like the areas of, of gender equity, for example, of thinking about how to, uh, how to provide skills, uh, how to provide credit, how to, um, uh, how, how to create economies that will uh, allow women uh, to, uh, to, to succeed and be empowered economically. We need to also start thinking about that for LGBTQ people. So I think that means going beyond the policies of non-discrimination to say, and, we will be more actively engaged in in training people who may have been uh, who may have faced disadvantages in the educational system, and providing uh, uh, help becoming an entrepreneur uh, for uh, for for people who maybe have um, don't have family members who are willing to co-sign a loan for them, for example, or to uh, to support them as they start a business. So there are many ways that the government can help provide that kind of support for low income. LGBTQ people who who have faced you know the who, who are kind of at the end of of many different kinds of exclusion and who who are going to need some support to to be more economically empowered. Okay, so like coming back to the same sex marriage issue now, like oh same sex marriage issue in India. So what do you think will be the potentially the impact of legalizing same sex marriage? Uh, on the Indian economy, like the wedding industry or the tourism industry? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Well, you know, weddings are really important, uh, uh, really important days and times for families and for individuals. And so we, we see large celebrations that, that happen as a result of, uh, of the decision to get married in many cases. And those could be uh, those could be very expensive. Uh, and so sometimes people will save money for them. And uh, and what will happen uh, if if same sex couples can get married is there will just be a lot more couples who have been waiting, and will will there'll be a surge? I would predict a surge of interest in in marrying lots a big wave of of weddings uh, that wouldn't have happened otherwise. You know, it, we call that pent up de pent up demand in economics, and that will that that will dissipate after a while after all the couples that are that now exist have have gotten married if, if that's what they want to do so that could be a big boost to economies i mean we in the united states we think that people spent billions of dollars on weddings uh the uh, people in same-sex couples you know they they spend money on food and look and venues for for their weddings there they invite their friends and family members who travel and come and stay in hotels and Go out to eat and go do other kinds of uh, other kinds of things that that spend money in local economies. So it, it could have a uh, you know it could have a sizable boost on on the Indian economy. You and you also asked about tourism. So India would become the first South Asian country to allow uh, same sex couples to marry, and so there may be people traveling from other countries also, or you know maybe even from farther beyond uh, South Asia. So you know some some countries like uh that have you know been in places where they are not uh where they're the only game in town in terms of uh in terms of marriage equality have seen that kind of tourism effect so so it could it could be a big boost in both of those ways for the indian economy uh i think like this is something like the fact that indian weddings are famously lavish right yes so that can have a very good impact like if we uh, if india legalizes the same sex marriage it can have a great impact like you said so truly in support of that now 
see uh, what uh, na- my next question would be what were the major findings of the 2014 study of the effect of homophobia and transphobia on the indian economy if yeah the big high level finding was that when you add up even just a few of the kinds of exclusion that we know uh, lgbtq people face in india that it adds up to a big number um and uh it was it was billions of rupees it was uh, roughly 1% of the indian economy uh if when we think about uh gross domestic product um so uh you know 1% you know it sounds like a small number but 1% of a huge economy like india's is uh you know is is sizable and i think what it suggests is that um that we're basically putting countries economies into a structural sort of recession right so if suddenly gdp drops that's what we call it a recession um but since we're there below the capacity of the economy um all the time because of exclusion that is that's what i would consider to be something that that's more structural the other uh work at the same time um uh, that uh that I did the specific study of India in 2014 um I was also working with some other colleagues to l- look across countries because you know the other way to think about the effects of homophobia and transphobia are to say that com- countries that are more uh accepting and inclusive in their laws or in their public opinion will should do better if if we're right about this effect and um so uh starting in 2014 and and for some years afterwards I have worked with several colleagues using different ways of measuring inclusion so we looked at laws uh about homosexuality uh and we looked at laws that come you know that went farther and combined um uh, rights for transgender people and we looked at uh public opinion in different countries and very consistently what we find is that uh the countries that are more inclusive in all those ways actually have stronger economies they have higher gdp per capita even after we control for all the other things that matter for how well countries do we still see that positive correlation between inclusion and uh and gdp per capita so it's a very strong it's a very strong relationship um uh over time so we've looked at countries over decades to 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 figure out you know what that what that correlation looks like so i think that that means we see both at the macro level and at the micro level you know if we think about it in economic terms that there there are these dynamics that do have uh that do have effects on on the economy as a whole exclusion's bad for economies and inclusion is good for economies uh i, I like learning from you and then i don't know why our government just does not realize the facts like these studies etc are available to them but i don't know why they just don't recognize it or something uh we but we we can just hope that they will learn from this and they will incorporate it and uh, we will have a inclusive right as a whole so my last question to you for the day would be like what lessons can india learn from the countries with successful lgbt inclusive inclusive mm-hmm. ones and what policies or measures can be implemented to promote greater inclusivity and economic growth yeah well we've talked about a lot of those i i think that um i i think that the most important kinds of principles are that that you have to look very deeply into economies and identify the places where where lgbtq people are not being included and we've talked a lot about the workplace talked a little bit about credit but that's very important uh, also as well um uh, for for the things that that you know people need to borrow money for uh for education for uh buying a home for starting a business for keeping a business running and for lots of other reasons uh um so so credit is very important the workplace is important the healthcare system is extremely important uh figuring out how to be fully inclusive there is key for for two reasons i mean one is that exclusion has these harmful effects on people's health 
And those harmful effects are, are made even worse when people access health systems that are not prepared to, to include them. So there are there's data uh, in India and in other places that suggest that uh, you know, people have different experiences if they're LGBTQ. They face discrimination from healthcare providers at many different levels. Um, so so having, a, having a healthcare system that's fully inclusive is key. Having an educational system is also key. So all of these really important development sectors um, need to uh, need to be analyzed very thoroughly to to see where there are problems, where there are kind of exclusion bottlenecks, maybe we could say, um, and uh, and to figure out how to how to how to address those. And it's not uh, you know it's it, it's because it covers so many sectors. It's it can be very challenging. And I've only mentioned a few of them. You know there there are many others we could talk about the transportation sector, the housing sector. Uh, but it, but it's important to know that uh, that exclusion can happen in all of those different contexts. So so I think uh, you know governments have the ability to to take that very wide view because they're involved in many different ways in all of those areas. And and uh, and by taking action, I think governments inspire uh, business owners to take action, uh, inspire ordinary people to rethink you know kind of how they might. Uh, um, how they might treat their LGBTQ family members or, or neighbors or coworkers. Um, so it's all it's 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 a, it's a system, and so we have to really address every aspect of that system of exclusion and turn that into inclusion. And that and that there's a reward at the end of all of that. <laughs> you know, I, in, in economics we sometimes talk about the invisible hand, the self interest, doing better will lead will guide people to do the right thing. You know, in a situation like this, uh, they're, they're headwinds. You know, sometimes they're political. Uh, people think that it's a politically popular. It may be popular to be LGBT inclusive. It may be popular to be anti-LGBT. You know, so there are, sometimes there are political interests at stake. Sometimes there are religious interests at stake. But, but, uh, but adding, you know, the economic component to the equation, you know, just shows, uh, you know, how much we're giving up. By, by by giving in uh, if we don't push for a fully inclusive economy. Uh, so I would just like to thank you for you know, giving us time, you know, taking, down, taking out time from your day, busy day and teaching us about this and inspiring us to actually work towards this. Uh, so this issue that is so prominent in our nation and the world as a whole. So I'm sure uh, all of all of us listeners have a lot more to learn from you, and we'll just. I, I <laughs> so, so sorry. So, I'm sure that our listeners will be will, will learn a lot from you and have received a lot from this particular podcast. And just thank you so much for sparing your time, sparing your time for this podcast. Thank well, you. Thanks for giving me the chance to talk to you about these important issues. Thank you.